what is Rumi's view towards suffering and how does suffering help one in their life and their spiritual journey. چه شیر پنجه نهد بر شکست آهوی خیش که ای عزیز شکارم چه خوش بود به خدا. چه جان زار بلا دیده با خدا گوید که جز تو هیچ ندارم چه خوش بود به خدا. جواب شاید از آن سو که من تو را پس از این به هیچ کس نگذارم چه خوش بود به خدا. When someone who has suffered and is broken turns to God, the answer comes from the unseen saying that now that you have submitted yourself entirely, I wouldn't leave you to anybody. The leading force is divine love. It's not fear. It's absolute ecstasy. It's not having to do something. It's doing it willingly. In one of his poems, he mocks the gamblers who play for money. He says they are children playing children's game. The real gamble, according to Rumi, is one in which you bet your entire existence. It's not your money. It's your soul. It's your life. It's your existence. Your everything. This is the kind of game he's playing with his divine beloved. He submits everything. He's emptied of himself. And that's how the divine light enters his entire existence. That's how his divine beloved illuminates him from within. چو اندر آید یارم چه خوش بود به خدا چو گیرد او به کنارم چه خوش بود به خدا How pleasant it is when my beloved appears. How pleasant it is when he takes me to a corner. Here Rumi alludes to divine manifestations. In Sufism, there are two general types of manifestations. The manifestations of the attributes of Jamal, that is, the attributes of beauty, which are pleasant, and the manifestation of the attributes of the Jalal. The attributes of the second category are more uh, awe-inspiring, more authoritative, more power-oriented. Given that in this particular poem, he repeatedly says uh, how pleasant it is. It's clear that he's talking about the attributes of the Jalal, the attributes of beauty. How majestic, how beautiful it is when the divine manifestations appear, when the divine shows himself, manifests himself through his attributes of beauty. How pleasant it is when he takes me to a corner. This hemistich can also mean uh, how pleasant it is when he hogs me. That is, how magnificent it must be when the divine beloved embraces me with his grace چه شیر پنجه نهد بر شکست آهوی خیش که ای عزیز شکارم چه خوش بود به خدا Here Rumi gives a very interesting analogy According to this analogy when a lion chases a gazelle instead of immediately hunting down breaking every bone and start eating when it realizes that poor animal has submitted and has no hope anymore Instead of killing the gazelle at once, the lion puts his paw on the gazelle, experiencing a feeling of ownership, a kind of satisfaction, a feeling of control. According to Rumi, God grants his grace through hardships and suffering. He hunts down some individuals, giving them hardships, giving them challenges, and at times suffering. Although on the face of it, it appears cruel, but through these hardships, he grants his grace. The picture Rumi paints here has chronic roots. According to the second chapter of the Quran, verses 155 to 157, God says, We test you with something of fear and hunger, with loss of your souls and bodies and your properties. Give glad tidings who exercise patience. Those are the people who are blessed. God puts some individuals into certain challenges. but when he realizes that the that, that person becomes weak at that moment because of those challenges, he puts his hand, meaning that he sends his grace on that individual, saying, Ey Aziz Shekaram, O oh my dear, pray. Challenges appear, and following them, kindness and grace appear. Here, like the famous problem of evil surfaces. If there is a good God, an omnipotent God, why is there evil? Either God is unable to do away with evil, eradicate it completely, or he doesn't want to do it. If so, the situation contradicts his omnibelevolence and his omnipotence. Evil exists, therefore God is neither omnipotent nor omnibenevolent. So this is the formal atheistic kind of argument against theism. Rumi faces the problem of evil uh, from a theological and mystical lens. It's not that God cannot eliminate evil or he does not want to eliminate evil is that he uses 
those hardships, those difficulties, and even suffering as trial through the challenges, humans develop morality, they develop moral character, and they strengthen their soul. So both ethics and mysticism come into play in, in, in this perspective. And this should be familiar to those from the Christian tradition. Uh, famously, John Hick has a similar argument, the soul-making theodicy. How beautiful it is that those who are swift in this spiritual journey, those who are agile, are taken to the skies. That is, they are enlightened in their path through these challenges. And how grand it must be to see those two beautiful eyes, the manifestations of his beauty. I am intoxicated by his eyes. How pleasant it is that he rescues me from this situation and he manifests himself to me. چو جان زار بلا دیده با خدا گوید که جز تو هیچ ندارم چه خوش بود به خدا جواب شاید از آن سو که من تو را پس از این به هیچ کس نگذارم چه خوش بود به خدا When someone who has suffered and is broken turns to God the answer comes from the unseen that saying that from now on I wouldn't leave you to anybody now that you have submitted yourself entirely now that you have put all your hope into me from now on it is only me and you. شب به سال بیاید شبم چه روز شود که روز و شب نشمارم چه خوش بود به خدا. When the night of union comes, the night turns into a day. The darkness turns into light. And at that moment, I wouldn't distinguish the night from day anymore. چه گل شکفته شوم در وسال گل رخ خیش و سب نسیم بهارم چه خوش بود به خدا. Upon that union, I would blossom like a flower. And upon that union, I feel the breeze of spring. بیا به من شکرستان بی نهایت را که بود صبر و قرارم چه خوش بود به خدا. All the lines in this poem have the phrase how pleasant it is. How pleasant it is. How pleasant it must be when I find the source of all that is sweet. امانتی که به نه چرخ در نمی گنجد به مستحق به سپارم چه خوش بود به خدا. How satisfying and pleasant it must be. When I return what was entrusted to me, back to him, universes cannot contain what was entrusted to me. Here Rumi refers to the divine love. The divine beloved entrusted me with love. A love so powerful and so vast and magnificent that the universe and universes cannot contain it. There is only the divine beloved who can contain and handle this love. I was entrusted with this love and how magnificent and joyful it must be when I reunite with him. خراب و مست شوم در کمال بی خیشی نه بدروم نه بکارم چه خوش بود به خدا. I am drunken. I am selfless. This mystic drunkenness, this mystic intoxication refers to the selflessness that results from divine love. Divine love, according to Sufism, is a powerful attraction. It's a powerful force. It takes the individual, it takes the seeker, pulls them towards God. But after some stage, the love becomes so intense that the mystic cannot distinguish their individual existence anymore. They are epistemically unaware of their individuality. This is exactly what is meant by drunkenness or selflessness. When I unite with my divine beloved, I'm not me anymore. I'm selfless. I'm intoxicated. <laughs> When the graces from the unseen come to me, I wouldn't utter a single word. Language has limitations, and there is the matter of sacred secrecy here. The secrets, the truths of the spiritual realm are to be veiled. Unlike those theologians who emphasize on, on, on being frightened from God, being in awe of God, Rumi has those too, but he is mostly emphasizing divine love. His path is not that of fear, it's the path of love. From the first step the seeker takes in this journey until the last step when they unite with the Divine Beloved. The leading force is Divine Love. It's not fear, it's absolute ecstasy. It's not having to do something, it's doing it willingly. In one of his poems he mocks the gamblers who play for money. He says they are children playing children's game. The real gamble according to Rumi is one in which you bet your entire existence. It's not your money. It's your soul, it's your life, 
It's your existence, your everything. This is the kind of game he's playing with his divine beloved. He submits everything. He's emptied of himself. And that's how the divine light enters his entire existence. That's how his divine beloved illuminates him from within. چو اندر آید یارم چه خوش بود به خدا چو گیرد او به کنارم چه خوش بود به خدا چو شیر پنجه نهد بر شکست آهوی خیش که ای عزیز شکارم چه خوش بود به خدا گریز پای رهش را کشان کشان ببرند بر آسمان چهارم چه خوش بود به خدا بدان دو نرگس مستش عظیم مخمورم چو بشکنند خمارم چه خوش بود به خدا چو جان زار بلا دیده با خدا گوید که جز تو هیچ ندارم چه خوش بود به خدا جواب شاید از آن سو که من تو را پس از این به هیچ کس نگذارم چه خوش بود به خدا شب و سال بیاید شبم چه روز شود که روز و شب نشمارم چه خوش بود به خدا چو گل شکفته شوم در و سال گل رخ خیش رسد نسیم بهارم چه خوش بود به خدا یا بمان شکرستان بی نهایت را که برد صبر و قرارم چه خوش بود به خدا امانتی که به نه چرخ در نمی گنجد به مستحق به سپارم چه خوش بود به خدا خراب و مست شدم در کمال بی خیشی نه بدروم نه بکارم چه خوش بود به خدا به گفت هیچ نیایم چه پر بود دهنم سر حدیث نخارم چه خوش بود به خدا